Hi, my name is Brad Mickley. I'm one of the project maintainers of KitOps and the CEO of Jozu. Today we're going to be talking about KitOps, which is an OCI-based packaging system designed specifically for AIML models. Uh, the problem that we were really trying to solve with KitOps was the artifacts themselves for an AIML project are quite scattered. And so reproducing that project in its entirety outside of, let's say, a Jupyter Notebook, if it was developed in it, can become a bit challenging. This adds delays and risks the more teams and individuals need to be involved. Uh, we were speaking to one of our users who uh, had worked at a major petroleum company, and they'd said that project where there was an individual data scientist who was responsible for that model throughout its life cycle tended to go quite smoothly. They tended to go all the way to production, they could be managed, there was really very few hiccups. But once you had multiple data scientists or multiple teams involved in the development, everything kind of ground to a halt. And typically they saw months of delays and frequently those prod prototypes never actually made it to production. So this really doesn't point to a technical issue with the development of models. This points to an organizational handoff issue between teams and that is exactly what KitOps wants to solve. Now, this is especially important now because, of course, five years ago, executives really had very little visibility into what data science teams did. But now you do have that. You've got executives who are asking questions like, is it ready yet? When is it going to be ready? Like children in the back of a car going on a road trip. Are we there yet? Um, and they're asking, are we compliant? Is it safe for users? Now, the data scientists are in probably the best position because they work with these models day in, day out. So the fact that you know, you've got some pieces in a Jupyter Notebook and other pieces in an experiment tracker like Kubeflow or MLflow or Weights and Biases and others in DVC and some in Git and Wikis and S3. They know where all those things are because they're touching these assets multiple times every day. And so it just becomes habit. But that to them then says, hey, this is ready. I can run this on my machine and therefore it's ready for production. Uh, I was speaking to uh, uh, the, a gentleman who runs engineering for one of the big uh, hedge funds in New York City. And he said that a data scientist had come to him and said, my model is ready for production. I just need a virtual desktop with 300 gigs of RAM. And of course, the response was, well, that's that's not really the right way. That's not actually ready for production. And that's pretty common. The teams that tend to get the pinch are those DevOps and SRE teams. They're often a little bit understaffed anyway. And they're not necessarily AIML experts, nor really should they have to be. Um, you know, we've spent the last 20 years running applications that the DevOps and SRE teams didn't necessarily understand deeply, but they were able to deploy them and manage them and diagnose them because of the tooling they had around those. When you say to a DevOps and SRE, hey, it works on my machine, it's ready for production, they're basically going to say some form of, uh oh, I've seen this movie before and I don't like the way it ends. And this is really mirrored even by folks in data science to some degree. Uh, speaking to a director of data science at one of the global logistics companies, uh, he said, currently we have an end-to-end -end ML ops solution. They use weights and biases from what I remember, but it lacks data versioning tied to model versioning and configuration. So those three parts, which are so critical to making an AI project reproducible, are really separate. They're handled in different places, often by different teams. There's usually a different data team than a model team, than the deployment team. And that makes it difficult for us to deploy and track AI projects. And difficult to deploy and track are not words you want to hear when you're an executive asking, where are things? Are they safe? Are they ready? So KitOps is all about centralizing those project assets, not changing the way the individual development needs interact with them, because that works. We, we talked about that. Um, Jupyter Notebooks work. Experiment trackers work. Um, Git is a great place to keep code. Don't change it. Uh, so we don't want to change that. But rather than having to scurry around to all these different locations and try and figure out, oh, model V2 works with parameters V34, which came from data set V16, which needs integration code V6, that's not obvious. That's not easy. You put all of that into a single model kit, and then what you pass around from team to team, individual to individual, what you reproduce, is what comes from your model kit v1. What's even more important is we didn't want to fall into the XKCD trap and end up creating the 15th standard. So we said as KitOps, look, this is a solved problem. Uh, OCI does something like this very well. So let's use an OCI artifact, not admittedly an OCI image, 
which is less flexible, but an OCI artifact, which gives us the flexibility to put the models, the parameters, the data set, the code, all into separate layers inside the model kit. And then the kit CLI can actually extract only those layers that an individual or a team needs to accomplish its part of that development lifecycle. So let's take a look at kind of what a model kit looks like inside of an OCI registry. Now, the registry I've chosen to use, and use obviously, is a Josu Hub. That's at josu.ml and is built specifically for model kits. So you get a lot of really rich information through the UI that you wouldn't through a typical registry, but you can still store these model kits perfectly in any OCI 1.1 registry. Now, in Josu Hub, of course, you can see our model kit signed, and you can sign this using standard container signing technologies that most organizations already have internally. So that, again, adds flexibility, makes it easy to adopt. But what's really compelling is, like I said, you can kind of glance at this and see that my model kit in this particular case includes a model, no data sets, one code base, two sets of docs, and of course, configuration for the model kit itself. Now, if I look in more detail at the model kit contents, I can see the package level where the metadata is stored about that. Um, that can include any key value pairing, JSON, YAML, whatever you want. I have a model section, which includes whether it is a single model or whether there are model parts, for example, because I'm doing a LoRa adapter, as in this case, uh, or RAG maybe. Do the serialization, in this case, this is a GGUF serialized model. And in the data sets section, I can see what data sets I have. In this case, it's training data in a uh, TXT format. Flipping over to the deploy tab, this is even more interesting, I think, and powerful, is that by using an OCI artifact, it's relatively easy for us to convert this into a runnable container. Um, it's not a runnable container itself, of course, it needs to be turned into an OCI image, but that's fairly trivial. Um, so in this case, of course, we've can choose between a basic container type or Llama CPP. This particular model was uh, LLM and we're gonna be using Llama CPP. We're gonna be expanding this of course over time to include VLLM and other container types as well um, as hardened container types. And then in this case, I chose Kubernetes, so I'm not getting a container directly, but I'm gonna get a Kubernetes deployment YAML and that's in matter of just copying and pasting. If I had chosen Docker, I would actually just get a Docker run command that would be able to pull directly from the hub my model kit um, OCI image. So all of this kind of helps to reduce enterprise risk. And that's one of the big things that organizations are, are saying when they come to use KitOps is, we want something that's tamper-proof. We want something that can be signed. We want to be able to see the provenance and the chain of changes that have happened to this AIML project, regardless of what team changed. Did the data set change? We want to know. Did the model change? We want to know. Did the embedding code change? We want to know. You always want to know. And you want that in a single source of truth, in a single location. Speaking to the director of MLOps at a uh, German government SI, one of the larger German government SIs, in fact, uh, they said, look, we have MLflow. We love it. But executives needed a tamper-proof and auditable solution to storage of these AIML projects. They had actually gone so far as considering forking MLflow to add secure storage themselves, but we're obviously very relieved to find KitOps and realize that they could actually do it right through there. And in fact, um, there is actually an MLflow plugin for KitOps that will automatically create a model kit for every experiment run in your MLflow uh, environment. So you kind of, without the user needing to do this manually, it can just happen in the background. Uh, so they continue to use the tool exactly as they always have, but you get these secure, auditable, tamper-proof um, packages out the back end. And that's really what we've tried to do with KitOps is make it easy for a, an organization to adopt by using existing standards like OCI and make it easier for teams to use by not forcing them to go through extra steps to create model kits, but instead just have it happen. We also offer the Pi KitOps PY KitOps library um, which is a Python library that you can embed, for example, in a Jupyter Notebook or in Instruct Lab or anything else so that you can actually, through code, build that model kit as you are um, executing the, uh, the model code in Jupyter Notebook or in VS Code or, or any other IDE of your choice. So why now? We talked a little bit, a bit about the executive visibility, but it goes beyond that. In the EU, of course, there is the AI Act and there are genuine severe regulatory penalties for not being able to show auditability and provenance for your models. But even beyond that and broader than that, it's hard to come across any large organization 
that hasn't come to a big realization in the last couple of years that their data is very, very important. It has high value. It should be kept private. It needs to be kept private. And so the organizations that we're speaking to are predominantly saying, yes, we use OpenAI or Mistral or something else online for experiments and prototyping, but anything we're going to do for our customers, we need to run and host internally online. And that's where I think this community especially has a lot to offer. There's also technical complexity. Composite apps, AI agents are much harder to deploy and operate. Um, they have a lot more interaction points. And it's much more critical if a model does begin to misbehave or show bias that you're able to track back through a set of changes in that model and say, aha, this is where something might have gone wrong. That might have been the cause. Let's run some better experiments now to, to address it. So let's talk about the alternatives. Some um, folks use Git repos to try and do this with something like Git LFS, but Git LFS is pretty awkward with uh, very large models and data sets. Uh, and you can't turn a Git repo instantly into a runnable project the way you can an OCI artifact. Um, some folks are trying to use something like a Nexus or an Artifactory, um, but typically you don't put data sets into those. And so you lose kind of the connection with one of those critical, critical pieces. You also don't typically put the experiments themselves into those repositories. So again, you've lost connection with another critical component for reproducibility. Um, you might be using Hugging Face publicly and there's nothing wrong with it. Hugging Face is great for a public repo, um, but it isn't going to give you a kind of private answer to this solution. Um, and itself doesn't also really do a good job of tracking kind of those uh, experiment styles. Some people assume that their end-to-end, quote-unquote, end-to-end ML ops tool, something like an ML flow or weights and biases is going to solve this for them, but it doesn't really. It's not vendor neutral. It's not an open interchange format. It's in many cases not tamper-proof at all. And you, again, can't convert these really into a runnable project. It's not operationalized there, despite the end-to-end -end name. So let's take a look at how KitOps is used in a secure org. So often it's the DevOps, SRE, or platform engineering team that will start, and, and frequently they want to create AIML templates for uh, teams to kind of safely start from inside their, their IDP, something like Backstage, for example. And so that template can include a model kit and the model kit itself, or multiple model kits if you want to break it up. So sometimes organizations want to have a model kit for the model and the experiments, um, the parameters rather, the code bases, and a separate model kit for the data sets. Um, others will combine them. It just depends on what kind of work for your organization and its processes. Teams can then take them. Uh, they might use a Jupyter Notebook to modify the model. As I mentioned, the PyKit Ops can allow them to very easily generate model kits as they're working in that Jupyter Notebook so they don't need to do it manually. It just kind of happens. Models often then need to go through a set of experiments um, to figure out what the best parameterization is. Uh, let's say you're using a Kubeflow or MLflow. Once again, you can automatically have those model kits generated on the back end of each of those experiments. Those then, once that's kind of hardened, get handed off to engineering teams, usually to integrate and test with the various applications that that model is going to interact with. Engineers can unpack only what they need. Once that's done and tested, that then typically gets handed off to DevOps, and they will now tag that model kit for production. If they're using something like Jozu Hub, they can obviously automatically generate that deployable container or the kubeyaml. Um, directly from that model kit, saving kind of some complexity as a step. And then inevitably, it comes time to replace a model. And so the model kit gets re-tagged, uh, typically as retired, to avoid any confusion in the future. It allows people also then to look at the history of, of kind of how that model kit has moved through the lifecycle process. So let's take a quick look at the model kit structure. Um, so within a model kit, you always have a kit file. You can think of that as kind of the recipe for the model kit, like a Docker file is to a container. There'll be a manifest, which includes details like the SHA um, and the media type for each layer. Uh, and then as we talked about, you've got model section where you can have models and parameters, code section for notebooks, scripts, whatever else you want, uh, Git repos, data sets, and documentation. Uh, the documentation is very flexible. You can include any key value pairing in there. You can include JSON, YAML whatever makes sense for your project and how it's going to be consumed. Now, 
looking at the kit file itself, uh, it's fairly straightforward and will look familiar to many of you, especially uh, given the variety of projects that use similar types of recipe files. So package includes the metadata from the model kit itself. Code section includes directories where code is located or single code assets, depending on whether you're using a repo or not. The model section can include a single model, um, but it can also include model parts. You can include the license, the framework, in this case, this one is scikit-learn, for example, and then data sets, uh, one for each data set you want to include. Again, it can be flat files, database files, da any other data object, really. So very, very flexible. Because of the flexibility of the model kits, because they're able to be used with existing OCI registries, because they can be easily converted into a, into a running image, we've really seen take up of KitOps accelerating rapidly. Um, we've actually already passed 50,000 downloads um, on, the, on the day you're watching this now. And you can see we're being used by very large enterprises, smaller enterprises, startups, uh, government agencies, public and private sector, uh, vendors, everybody um, is, is seeing value from this project. Uh, one of the DevOps leads at one of our uh, users has said, we see KitOps as the gate between development and production. Now, this is within a government organization. And so for them, controlling and securing that transition from development to production is critical. Now, a data scientist with one of the leading virtual workout providers um, said the development process used to be a struggle between devs and data scientists, but KitOps creates a middle ground for them, something that the devs can contribute to, the data science can contribute to, that they can pass off and hand off between them. And that brings everybody together. Now, KitOps has been seeing consistent uh, releases and improvements. In Q1, we released CI/CD actions for GitHub Actions, Dagger, um, uh, OpenShift, uh, Pipelines, a number of different, uh, different sources. Kit Dev allowed you to start an LLM kit directly from a model kit locally, so you didn't need to worry about uh, having other infrastructure on your machine. Q2, we doubled the speed of model kit packing, added model parts to support LoRa and RAG, and optimized local storage. Q3, we added resumable downloads because, especially for LLM, some of these model kit kits, get, kits can get very large. And also to deal with that size, we added unpack with filter option. Uh, that flag allows you to select that you only want to, you know, uh, pull the model layer, or maybe I only want to pull one data set out of the data set layer because that's all I need. It really allows you to make sure that you're not grabbing a 300 gigabyte model kit for an LLM when all you need is, you know, a couple megabytes of, uh, of data or code. Q4, we submitted KitOps to the CNCF sandbox and are uh, hopeful that we will be approved into sandbox status. Uh, in March during that review cycle. We also began working with organizations like Red Hat, like the Ant Group, ByteDance, PayPal, and others on what we hope will become the CNCF standard specification for AI model packaging based on OCI artifacts. We added a homebrew tap for KitOps to make it easier to install and proxy support for large enterprises. And in Q1, just in the last couple months, we've uh, added the ability to do a kit import command, which actually auto-generates a model kit from any Hugging Face repo by just dropping in the Hugging Face URL, nice and simple. Or you can auto-generate the model kit from any directory. Uh, it just kind of helps people who are less comfortable with hand editing kit files to get started with model kits super easy, super quickly. Ultimately, KitOps is really about saving folks time and reducing risk. Uh, we've seen about three days of reduction that is saved in each AI project iteration. And so, of course, most, most projects go through many iterations, so potentially very significant savings as you look at its impact across multi-team development projects. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you found it useful. You can chat with us on Discord, the link is there on the screen, or you can check out our repos for KitOps, for the PyKitOps Python library that I mentioned, or for the KitOps MLflow plugin. If you search online, you'll also find uh, information on GitHub Actions for KitOps and a Daggerverse set of plugins for Dagger for uh, KitOps as well. Thanks very much and have a great day.